without further ado, I feel like I've bum bum bum. Um, Andrew Woke, everybody, please welcome him with a warm applause. Thank you, uh, Sophia, so much. Um, I think, can I have you come and introduce me everywhere I go? <clears throat> I don't know that that could have been yeah, yeah, a great hype man. And you know that word. I didn't know that. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me here today. Uh, it's, um, it's not only an honor to be able to get, do this, but it's particularly an honor. I was telling someone earlier that um, I've done a lot of public speaking, but um, I think you'll hear I, I stopped about five or six or seven years ago um, to just take a step back and reflect what you hear a little bit more about. So I've only begun to start doing this again, um, and so it's really a great honor to be able to come and and share what I'm going to share with you all today, and hopefully get you to, you know, pique your interest and maybe think a little differently <clears throat> and learn something. Um, so I'm going to tell you um, my story in two parts. Um, I'll do one part, which will be more of the origin story of root cause, and I'll pause. So if there's questions you want to hear about that, I'll take a little time to to answer some of them, and then I'm going to engage you in a question as well, and then I'll move into a second part of the story. Uh, but the first part of my story is really what I like to call from entrepreneur to serial social entrepreneur. And um, it starts with uh, I was running a restaurant delivery service, uh, which is basically DoorDash, but back in the late 90s. So pretty early in that sort of thinking um, in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Typical, uh, had a bunch of restaurants, got drivers, and deliver food to people. I'm sure you guys all use DoorDash or something like it, Uber Eats now. Um, and I was growing that business pretty aggressively. There were other companies that were in Fairfield County, Connecticut that I acquired. We were growing employees. But I was getting a little nervous about what it would mean to sort of take this and really grow it. And did that, was that really what I wanted to do? Um, what I was instead finding was that the people I was employing I found to be kind of interesting in, the, in their life circumstances. Um, because we were pretty much a night business, most of the people that worked with us actually had day jobs. And in those day jobs, they needed to make ends meet by having this second job. And I was sort of curious about their lives. And so I started to do things in the business to help them. Um, I put some software on the computer terminals for those that were answering calls to help them gain training skills to maybe take back and maybe advance their careers. I brought bankers into the company to let them learn what it would be to save up to be able to buy a home and be able to pay enough for a mortgage. And I was sort of just naturally doing this as opposed to maybe how I might get more meals delivered. Um, and then I read this article that came out in, I think it was 1996, um, by a guy named Greg Dees, who unfortunately passed away, called The Meaning of Social Entrepreneurship. And it was this term that I was like, oh my god, that's, that's what I am. I'm this guy who wants to start things, but I don't want to just start them to make money and supply a service or a product. I want to do good while I'm doing something at the same time. And I was like, oh, that's it. That's what I want to do. Um, so I put Ruka, uh, excuse me, I put Doorstep Express, that was the name of the company on the market, and I sold it. Um, and I was going back to business school to get a degree in nonprofit management and entrepreneurship here in Boston at Boston University. And I had this really odd sort of moment. <clears throat> and there were two of them that had this sort of big sort of aha for me. Um, the first was right before I did that, I hadn't volunteered a day in my life. I hadn't even been in a nonprofit before. And I volunteered at what's called a Voluntary Action Center in the Giuliani administration in New York City. I grew up in New York. And my job was simply to have people come in and say, I want to volunteer somewhere. I go on a computer terminal. You probably can't imagine looking at the age what that would look like, but it was a dot matrix printer and an old IBM. And if they said that they were interested in kids, I found a nonprofit or a government agency that said they needed help. And I printed out this piece of paper, and I handed it to them, and off they went. And um, I had just gone through a fair amount of rigor to start a business, took on some debt, had some investors. It took a lot to sell it. And I asked if we had any idea of the person that I was um, working for what happened once I handed them this piece of paper. And they said, well, that's all. We just handed a piece of paper. And um, I said, well, would you mind if I just did my own time and found out 
and maybe called a few. So I went on for the next month of calling a bunch of people to find out. And what I found out was that for the limited people that I called, that there were only 3% that actually ended up volunteering. Um, and not, not necessarily whether the volunteer experience was valuable, whether the organization found it valuable, it was more than just 3%. And that sort of struck me as really odd. Not only did it strike me as odd, but when I went to the person who works with me um, and, and shared that information, she shared back that um, we were just being counted by how many people came through our door. So that was sort of story number one. But story number two, because I was then like, well, I, I'm the shit. I know. that What an amazing thing. And I'm going to take all this great information I have, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to save the world, and I'm going to start and be an entrepreneur. So I went back to business school, and I started to offer up this great knowledge I had um, to nonprofits locally here in Boston while I was in school. Um, and pretty much to a T, um, every one of them that I went to, except for one, um, told me to go to hell, basically. They said, well, who the hell are you? And what do you know about what we do? And you're this private sector guy, and you're cocky, and you're this, and you're that. And, um, and, they, and they really wanted me to understand sort of the I guess what you might say mission-based work, right? That, that the, the deep roots of why you would actually want to get involved in this sort of work. And, um, and that got me to really think about, while being a social entrepreneur and wanting to do that and start Root Cause, that you needed to come with this understanding of why people got involved in this work in the first place. And so um, when I graduated Root Cause, Boston University, I started Root Cause with this notion of trying to bring from a mission-based perspective, uh, what it would mean to bring maybe some more rigor, strategy, measurement to nonprofits, foundations, government agencies. And that was back, as, as um, Sophia said, back in 2004. Um, and that journey, I, I'm very proud of it. I'll tell you a few different things that we've done over that time, just to give you a sense of some of the work. Um, um, in that time, I um, have started a couple of Nonprofit programs that have spun off and one for-profit um, consulting firm. Um, one of them you may have heard of but didn't know maybe it came out of root cause is called the Social Innovation Forum. Um, the Social Innovation Forum was this general notion that we have like the MIT Forum where, you know, for-profit entrepreneurs can pitch in front of donors. Well, why wouldn't you have the same thing for nonprofits? So started where you could apply for this program, we would give you capacity building on how to build your pitch and think about how to communicate, and then we would fill a room like this and nonprofits could pitch. Um, and that spun out of root cause um, in 2015. Um, another program that, we, that I started out of uh, root cause is called Interrise, which is also based here, but is in about, I think maybe 26 or 30 different cities across the country. And that was this idea that small business is sort of an anchor in any local community and that a lot of business development is focused on starting businesses, which is very hard to do. You may know the statistics are eight or nine fail. And why wouldn't we spend more time on these existing ones and grow them in some way? Um, and both of those sort of spun out. And then at the heart of what Root Cause has done for the last almost 20 years now, is really strategy and measurement um, consultings for nonprofits and foundations and government agencies. And just to give you um, a couple of examples of our work, just to give you a sense of it, is um, we run for the State Street Foundation um, something called the Workforce Investment Network. We've been doing that for four years now. Um, and that's working with um, five organizations. A lot of them you've probably heard. They're relatively strong brand names, Year Up. You Aspire, the Private Industry Council, um, and then how we help them work together in um, 26 Boston public high schools across the city to make sure that students have the right access to services like college guidance, which we might take for granted, <laughs> financial guidance, which some of us might take for granted, work and career exploration, and then coaching when they move from, from high school into college to persist their way through. Um, so that's one piece of work that we've been doing. Um, another um, piece of work is that we've written over the course of many, many years um, business plans for nonprofits. Um, that, that was a sort of core part of our work. And 
came out with a practical guide of how to write a business plan for social impact. Um, so we've rat written countless business plans of how you um, have a, an organization that started and how could it scale and attract more resources and so on and so forth. Um, so that, that gives you sort of just a general early stage sense of, of the trajectory of root cause and sort of my impetus for starting it. And before I tell you about the sort of second part of this journey, I, I, I want to pause. I wanted to get that origin story out quick. And, and I'm happy to take a couple of questions before I move to sort of the repositioning. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you speak to a little bit, it sounds like you've been in this space for quite a long time, and but in parallel, or in at least the last 10 years, you're seeing the rise of uh, benefit corporations or certified B Corps. Um, can you just speak to you know, your work, uh, kind of working in parallel with that, and how this is, you know, we were talking about the Patagonias of the world, Ben and Jerry's, these companies, these for-profit companies that are now um, kind of wading into your landscape, so to say, in a way. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I have a story on that trajectory as well, and then I'll just share my thoughts. So the story on that trajectory, interestingly enough, is that wanted to at least have root cause be part in that space. And ironically enough, you can get paid more to help nonprofits <laughs> than you can help for-profits figure out how they might be able to do good. So it's, it's, it's interesting. And then um, you may have read in my bio. So for a long time, I taught social entrepreneurship in a, in a bunch of universities. I, I started one of the first courses in, in 99 in BU and went to teach at the Heller School in Boston College and then finally at MIT. Um, and um, it's interesting in teaching at those places, the value add of the business school students was pretty low. <laughs> and the value add of teaching nursing students, social work students was pretty high, which was really sort of disappointing to me. Um, so this is before the B Corp. Um, and I think the B Corp is an amazing evolution. Um, I just think it's fantastic. Um, I think it's given a grounding for what is needed for, for people who are pursuing um, just your classic entrepreneurship business work, right? Produ producing a product or a service to try to make some money on it, but how you might do that in a way that also, so I think it's in its early stages of really transforming at least some businesses. Um, I think we do have a divide between small and corporate, <laughs> and there's a lot of challenges around the corporate side, which is a whole different talk that I could give. Um, but I would highly recommend for those of you who own your own business or are part of them that to go to the B Corp, they have amazing things, particularly the way they think about governance, because governance is sort of the challenge about balancing, maximizing profitability and changes you might want to make in your business. So i um, a big fan. So what has been your biggest failure and what has been your biggest achievement so far? <laughs> yeah, sorry. So biggest failure and biggest achievement. Wow. Um, well, I mean, I'll start with the achievement first. I mean, I'm very proud of the work that we've done, even though you're going to hear the second part of the story. And I think we've made a lot of difference, and a lot of people have come through Root Cause also to work there and gone on and are doing a lot of great work and, and hopefully are bringing um, a rigorous lens to being part of um, the sector that I, um, that I really like. So I think I, I'm proud of the inception of root cause and the organizations we've worked with and so on and so forth. I, you know, I, I don't want to be too deliberate. Um, I might say that when I talk about this work we did with the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, which will be what triggered my second part of my story, that might be the engagement I'm most proud of um, because it really was getting at the root of some challenges around who may be succeeding and who may not. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I'll, 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 I'll share this disappointment and hopefully won't get into too much trouble. Um, but it comes to mind, so I'll do it. Um, we, uh, we were fired on only a couple of jobs in our entire career. Um, and one of those jobs is working with the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. <clears throat> and um, in that job, we were helping them with their revision of their business plan overall. And I went deep in understanding the history around charter schools. And the irony around charter schools, it was actually created um, in Michigan as a way to reallocate some tax dollars to bring innovations to the public school system. Um, and because the public school system, as we know, is, has its challenges. Um, and as we got more and more into that engagement and trying to sort of 
uncover that reason why we found that it had really gotten, and we'll get to the second part of my story, co-opted by instead it being an us versus them, which I think you see in the papers now all the time. I think people associate charter schools with this is the way versus this is a way as opposed to we're just trying to educate more children. Um, and I think we pushed pretty hard to try to bring that original vision of what charter schools are around to the point where we were let go um, and there just wasn't a message. And I wonder back now whether or not the approach we took was not the right approach to maybe get them to maybe do an and versus an or in some way. Um, so great question. Maybe I'll take one more and then I'll move us on. Yeah. You had mentioned the value added for nursing students and social work was more so than business <clears throat> Yeah, um, the value add of nursing students and social work students. Um, I, I think that they're trained in their profession um, it, that's all good to, because they need the, the really critical skills to work with people. But I don't know that they are um, trained well to understand what they have to navigate to make the kind of difference they really want to make in the lives that they're working with, right? And that they are um, up against partnerships, challenges that people that they're working with are facing, systems that they're within. Um, and, and that's instead isolated into a silo of this is exactly how they should do their job. And, and, I, think that, and I think that when they, had their eyes open to the complexity of the change with, with, a, with a sort of a measurement lens overall, I think that opened their eyes up a little bit more um, when I think there's a bit of starry-eyedness of why people choose that kind of work in a good way, in a good way. As opposed to the business students who? I, I don't know if I'd say it's cynical. I mean, it's, it's not a bad thing, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm not here to, to criticize capitalism purely in its pure, sense it's everyone can ha have its arguments about whether it's working for everyone right now. Um, I just think that their mindset is they're there to go to business school, get a job, and make a lot of money, right? And so I just think it's a different mindset. So you're stretching them away that that's not why they're there. So you're asking them to come into a class that's to maybe dip a toe in the water to think differently, but not sort of transform their way of thinking is what I would say um, is probably. Um, so let me ask you all, uh, perfect timing, um, a question. Um, I'd love to hear, um, now that I've told you, I mean, I've spent my career working with nonprofits and foundations and so on and so forth, and I'm gonna share a little bit about, you know, what my point of view is at that point. I I'd love to hear what yours is, right? For whatever experiences that you've had, um, you know, when you hear about the nonprofit sector, what do you think about? You know, when you talk with your colleagues about it, when you see it on the media, just just anything that comes to mind. I just love to hear a few people's thoughts. Bridget, um, I worked for one, and I found it was hard to sustain a living off of it because they want to keep so much money into the business. But then I felt like people weren't getting paid enough to stay there, and that's why a lot of people will leave because the benefits aren't enough as they should be, but I get they have to only make a certain amount to keep the nonprofit status, but I wish there was more an investment in the people working for certain nonprofits, because it is hard to stay if you can't, you know, support yourself. Sure. Who else? I would simply say wonderful intentions and poor execution. Wonderful intentions, poor execution. I volunteer as the director of a local nonprofit, and I think one thing that I think a lot about is volunteer retention and keeping those talented, passionate people. How to do it, how to do it well. Maybe a couple more, anyone? Um, we produce a lot of videos for nonprofits, and the storytelling around them is certainly, there's an, a strong element of movement building in order to get that message across and, and bring people to your cause. It's a, a big theme we see across them. Anyone else? Back here? I see a hand here. One more up here. Hi. <clears throat> I have the pleasure of running a nonprofit, so uh, I think one of the things that's kind of fun 
uh, I call it an opportunity, is that nonprofits in the traditional sense are basically what old people do in their spare time. And so, <laughs> just keeping it that. real. Nonprofits are what old people do in their spare yeah. time. <laughs> so I think the challenge, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like a young old person. Uh, so the challenge now is how do we get the, the new generation, however you define that, to be involved as volunteers, as board members, because it's just not a thing that people think about. I got one more there, then I'm going to stop it. Um, I went to grad school and got my MFA, and you kind of feel like you're like trying to make a nonprofit while you're there, while si simultaneously um, you're kind of taught to to hustle, so like you get out and you're hustle, 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 and the first thing that comes with hustle is funding, and that doesn't seem to ever mesh with a nonprofit, and it's like you're too, the creative mind just goes in two different directions, and I think it's <coughs> hard to be entrepreneurial with no money while trying to think about nonprofit as a young person, so maybe it's something you can invest in when you're more established, but it's hard when you're first starting out to push in that direction. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so part two of my story, quite frankly, is a story of disillusionment um, <clears throat> and probably more questions than answers. I want to reiterate, and not just for saying that I'm proud of the work that I've done to date and that I've worked with and, and proud of the work that you're doing, because the intentions of, are all good. There, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I mentioned that maybe the thing I'm most proud of is the, the starting of um, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Um, but it also was the moment where the disillusionment started. Um, and basically, uh, you know, our role was to think about the strategy of what it would take to um, improve life outcomes for black men and boys across this country. And one of the things that we decided to do, because measurement is something we think that's really important, is we said, well, you guys really have a dashboard of, of, of outcomes. And so you can sort of say, well, wh where are outcomes at? And, um, and so we put that dashboard together, things like high school graduation aid, reading proficiency, things that you know are standard measures that, that you would think about. And, um, and we were doing it in, in key cities that had generally fair, more significant populations um, of uh, black men and boys, and um, came across a statistic that 4% of boys were reading at proficiency level in third grade in the Detroit public schools, <clears throat> 4%. Um, and, and I said to the people who work for me, you have to go back and check that. 4%, there's just no way that's possible. Um, and they went back and checked, so then I dug deeper to try to get some trend data and found that over a 10-year period that we could go back to, the number was the same. So it had been 4% for, for over 10 years. And, and I started to ask myself, well, huh, that, that just, you know, with the energy that, that we're putting in and probably is going into that, well, how is that number staying stagnant? Um, so I started to think more about that. And, and, and what I've come to the conclusion to is that what's grown around us without us even realizing it is what I and some others are calling the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, and that it's made up of literally hundreds of thousands of nonprofits across the country, thousands of foundations, a myriad of government programs at every level. Um, we've got, proud to say, millions of volunteers, millions of donors out there. Um, but what's it all adding up to? Um, it's employing 30 million people, so it's, it's be a myth of uh, trillion dollars, perhaps, in spending, 30 million people employed. And, and I asked myself the question, and I'm sort of posing an agenda, to what end? You know, uh, you know, what is it all added up, though, that's grown tracking back, I think, perhaps back in the early 60s, maybe with the Great Society programs, and that we've, we do have this industry that you can go into, and you can work, and you can look into a profession. Um, and so I started to ask this question, um, and at the same time said to myself, well, if you said to yourself, well, to what end? You might want to ask, well, what does success look like in the 21st century? What, 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 are, what do most people want? And I asked myself that, and I asked other people around that. And, and I kind of got the same answer for everyone, which was that people just want to get their basic needs met, at the very least, right? 
food, clothing, shelter, and get on a pathway to what I'm calling sort of lifelong success. You want to, you know, if, if you're a parent, you want your kid to be born healthy. You want to hope that you can get access to a quality education that will lead to a decent paying job and ultimately um, live a healthy and secure life. And, and that more people doing that would seem like that would be the basic things um, that you would want. Um, but at the same time, what I was finding out was that that's not actually happening when this complex has sort of been built around us. Um, and so this pathway to lifelong success appears to be a simple framework. And actually, when you dig into it and you ask someone what they may want, or you ask even a nonprofit you know, what they may want as their outcome, you can look over here, and, and this sort of represents healthy birth, and then you're moving on to college, I mean, to school and on to college or some post-secondary training, and then you go to work, and finally, sustainable aging. Um, but how are we doing? And I'm just going to read a few data points um, and then see if anyone has any comments about this. Um, so starting at the beginning, and I just have a few here, um, low birth weight. Um, is a classic sort of measure of sort of healthy births. Um, and that number was at 7% um, in 1996. You would think in, in the United States we'd have a, a lower number than that. Um, but even so, if you're concentrating on the, that number has actually gone up um, by 1% um, as of about 12 years later. Um, reading proficiency. Um, in both fourth and eighth grade since 1992 has just gone up by 3% across the country. So it stayed pretty stagnant across the country, basic reading proficiency. The American dream, which is defined by one's ability to be better off than their parents, in 1940, 90% of the people were better off than their parents. That number, as of 1991, I think it is, has dropped to below 50%. Here in Boston, I'm not going to give you trend data, but I'm going to give you a few data points that I just ask sort of shockingly. Um, math, fourth and eighth grade reading, hovers at about 32% proficiency. Um, Reading proficiency hovers at 28%, this is Boston Public Schools, and science proficiency at about 16%. And so when I ask sort of like what our common purpose is and how we get people on a pathway, I, I, I kind of think back to sort of when we wanted to put a man on the moon. I mean, how is it that we would want 60% reading proficiency or 80%? And why wouldn't we be driving at you know, singular measures that we could all unify it and get around in whatever aspect of our work that we would do. Um, and instead what I found, including root cause and where my disillusionment came, was that I'm in that self-survival mode. Where am I getting my next funding, my next contract, my next grant? I want to keep my people. I want them to make sure they can work, and so on and so forth. So I'm wrapped up in the complex for which I am now stating is existing, and I am a contributor of it. There's no doubt about it, because I'm just trying to sustain my own work, prove my own value, tell my better story, which can definitely get me more contracts in some way. Um, so I'm here starting to say, well, to what end? And, and, and maybe how we move from some of that individual responsibility to more of a collective responsibility. Um, so I will pause there um, and ask you, you know, shaking heads this way or shaking heads this way, what is this getting you to think? Um, I, I'd be curious to hear for those daring enough to, to share their thoughts. Yeah, you had a lot of head nodding all the way through, so I'm glad you raised your hand. Talking about human agency and the important, importance of giving people that we're trying to help a sense of agency, yep. and, and how nonprofits kind of close down that space. So how do you keep that space open while providing help? You are absolutely right. And one of the key things is, um, which write about it, um, in this blog, I started finding common purpose, but I learned this from a woman who runs a food bank, the Oregon Food Bank, is we have to stop doing for 
and start doing with. Um, we have to stop doing for and start doing with. It's like we've decided that there's this savior that we're going to be, which is both dehumanizing and not really in a listening mode. So you, you, you are absolutely right about that. Yeah. You got it. Sorry. Uh, hello? Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I run a nonprofit as well. And I kind of started it without really knowing what a nonprofit and a for profit was. But as my research goes, um, I feel like Massachusetts uh, doesn't really support nonprofits as much as they do in other states. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, because um, nonprofits in Massachusetts uh, act like, exactly the same as a for profit. And I thought this was pretty interesting because when I started my nonprofit, I wasn't intending to do this um, uh, volunteer based or anything like that. So everyone at our company is paid. Um, no one's a volunteer. And I do this because of my musical background. And I think <laughs> and I think it's because musicians tend to be volunteer based in a lot of places, right? So if you go into a venue, they don't get paid. Um, and it's more of like a, you're doing this as a passion. And I really disagree with that statement. So that's why, even though I do a nonprofit, I still pay them, even though it's all out of passion. So I feel like there needs to be something now, today, where it's in between a nonprofit and a for-profit, something that supports the passion, something that supports all the purpose without all the negative outcomes of a typical nonprofit and without all of the financial burden of a for-profit. Yeah, yeah. And I think you, I would really recommend the person who asked the question about looking up that B Corp model mm -hmm. um, as an interesting way to go based on your reflections of the, of the, of the state, the state. And I'm going to let you cut me off when you want, so that's fine. Who else would make a comment? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm a recent grad from the Heller School. Oh, great. Um, we have two Heller School grads at Root Cause who are <laughs> phenomenal. Oh, great. Good to hear. Um, yeah, I have my MBA in, in nonprofit management and also my master's in public policy. So thinking about the nonprofit industrial complex that you outlined, I think um, from my perspective, uh, can't help but think about the role specifically in American democracy that the social welfare kind of gap provides a vacuum for that nonprofit industrial complex. Um, so as someone who you self-identified as a serial social entrepreneur, I'm wondering what kind of role you see for, for other folks who are looking to be social entrepreneurs, like folks coming <clears throat> out of SIF, um, and, and kind of what role you see the public sector yeah. playing in this as well. So let me start by saying I'm having a little trouble, which, you know, if there's going to be a survey that's going to go out about what you thought about what I had to say to give me tips and, and, and so on. Um, so the term, I'm having a lot of trouble with the term because I really want to include the public sector in it for the very reason that you said. Um, and, and I include public schools, charter schools. I did say government programs. It's interesting enough, you know, while there are fewer government programs and nonprofit programs, they dwarf in terms of number of people served. We, we're working with 13 local early childhood programs in Guilford County, North Carolina right now. One of them is WIC. They serve 15,000 families. Um, that's more than all the other ones we work with combined. Um, so, um, so my answer, to, so first I'm just letting you know that I'm including that part of it. With that said, um, I don't think that the, um, I think that my mentality of social entrepreneur with a silver bullet, and I have the answer to end hunger, um, get all kids to be reading at grade level is crazy. I think that's the mentality of where I came from, the private sector, and you're going to be the next Microsoft. Um, the systems of the systems that are the public school systems, the health systems, so on and so forth. So your ability to partner with them and understand them and where you fill that gap within the existing systems that are there and have policies and laws in place, I think is absolutely critical. And then as you move into this part of the pathway, let's say workforce development or something like that, there's a great organization here in CIC where we used to be housed, we're now in Cambridge, called Resilient Coders that trains people um, to get jobs, um, really, really good paying jobs, 
But the key to their model is forming really great partnerships with big employers, right? So that's another key part of the system, right? And not thinking that your universally unique idea is really gonna make more of a difference than about 10, 15, 20, 500 kids, right? But if you get inside the system where they are or where the people are and really understand that partnership, I think your depth of change can make a much greater difference.